Hey everybody, it's Dr. Jamie and the Fit and Fabulous podcast is a safe space for all kinds of discussion and today's sponsor is Bush. They are all about self-love, a wellness brand that's changing the conversation around self-pleasure. Bush's self-love movement is all about empowering people to love their bodies and the amazing things that it can do by breaking the stigma around self-pleasure. After all, self-pleasure is the next big thing in beauty. You guys just watch. It's great for your health, it's great for your skin, and it's great for your mood. I'd love to introduce to you the favorite vibrator from Bush called the Empress 2. The Empress 2 is a vacuum clitoral stimulator. It's ergonomic. It has a cute pink design. It's got curves that fit all the right places. It's got powerful vacuum technology. It's 100% waterproof, perfect for bubble bath time. There's 40 pleasure combinations, something that works for every body. Magnet, USB charging. There's no fussing around with batteries. It's discreet in all the ways. Your business stays your business with a quiet design and discreet shipping. So you guys embrace self-love by adding the Empress 2 to your cart right now. You can use the code FITFAB. That's F-I-T-F-A-B for an exclusive 60% discount on the Empress 2. And please visit the link in the episode notes right now where you'll also find the discount code. Thank you to today's sponsor, Bush. to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie. Welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. It's so nice to have you all back. I just want to thank everybody who's listened to our previous episodes. Every time you download, leave reviews, you share it with your family and friends, you're helping us spread these messages across the world. So thank you. I have an amazing colleague on today's podcast. I have been super excited to have her on now for a while, and I'm glad the stars aligned and our schedules aligned (laughs) because we're both busy moms and doctors. So I want to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Kelly Casperson, you guys. She is a urologist. Uh, She's born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota, went to med school at the University of Minnesota. You guys, she's a gopher. I'm a Husker, but we'll leave that aside. (laughs) She did her uh, surgical internship and urology residency at the University of Colorado. She's a board certified urologist, uh, which, you know, in, in our field, we see a lot of male urologists. So just the fact that she's a female urologist, I think is Super, super badass. Um, what I love most about her, though, is I got introduced to Dr. Casperson on social media. She has an amazing, hot new podcast that I want you all to hear about so that you can go listen. And um, she's created these online courses to teach women about the fundamentals of their own anatomy, how their body works, to talk about sex, things that don't get talked about a lot in women's health, which is why I think you guys are going to love this episode. I do want to just do a little disclaimer before I let Dr. Kelly start speaking that this is probably content that's for mature audiences. So if you have any little ears around and you don't want them listening to this podcast, now would be a great time uh, to go make, make a snack or do something else. So Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I feel like we we get to mutual fangirl each other, which is super fun. Okay. So tell people exactly what you do and talk to us about what you do in your real clinical world and then what you do in your social media world, because I think we're very alike in that we have passions that we don't really get to do a lot in our clinical practice. Yeah, totally. I it's it's great to have somebody like see that, right? So in my real life, right, in the real world, I am a general urologist. I tend towards female. So female urology includes bladder leakage, uh, pelvic organ prolapse, recurrent UTIs, but everybody gets kidney stones and things like that. So general urology, and I've been out for about nine years now. So out means done with residency. And about three years ago, roughly, I had a lady who I had been taking care of for five years. We did some bladder cancer work, cured her from bladder cancer. And she was crying in my office about not wanting to be sexually intimate with her husband, who she loves, and she's in a long-term committed relationship and just bawling because there just was no desire there. I had nothing to offer her except for a box of Kleenexes. And that's when I was like, is it true? Is it true we don't actually know anything about female sexual function? Because when I was in residency, I was told women are too complicated. We don't understand it. 
here's some the Viagra for the men. And I was finally like, who's taking care of the people who are sleeping with the people with the Viagra I'm giving out, right? So then I went deep dive into like what the science and the researchers actually know about female sexual function. And I'm like, they actually know a lot. Mm -hmm. It's just not trickling down into the average, you know, day-to-day -day life of people. And then this voice in my head was like, you have to start talking because you can't do enough by just seeing people in clinic, right? So that's where the podcast, was. she was born, that voice, you then find out that voice is like your future self, right? Pulling you forward wow. of like, and it's exploded. Like the fact that I'm reaching people in Pakistan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia, like I'm number one in Belize. Like it's crazy how international this is because nobody gets an education, men or women, nobody gets an education. But to go, to tie it back into my day-to-day -day job, like I actually don't talk about sexual function all that much in my day job. Probably like you, I have like 15 minute appointments. It's in and it's out. And it's like, if you've never been taught sexual health or function or anatomy, I can't give it to you in 15 minutes. I just can't do it. Like I'm not the person for you. So that's why I love that there's a podcast I can refer them to. I have a book coming out in 2022 about it. It's like, go learn, bring that into your doctor to say, hey, can I, can I try to think about hormones? Can I think about this? Because I can't teach it all to you in a 15 minute doctor right. appointment. Well, and I think, you know, when you're saying I have this podcast is big all over the world, I think that really highlights the cultural norms in different places in the world, different countries, um, which is why what you're doing is so amazing because in a, even in America, which is very sexual liberal, I guess, you know, I would describe it compared to other countries that really, you know, shroud women in more modesty and things like that. Even in America, women are afraid to ask about it. I see women in my own clinic as a gynecologist who, unless you specifically ask about their sexual function, you know, arousal, desire, unless you specifically ask those questions, most women will never bring it up. No, and, bring it up. and in traditional medical models, you're right. Like we have 15 minutes, like we're there to diagnose what's actually pathologic. And the title of your podcast is called You Are Not Broken which is why, you know, we're in clinic to diagnose the things that are wrong. And there's really nothing wrong with women. There's really yeah, nothing wrong yeah. with women. So why do you wrong women... with them? Okay. So let's talk about it. Why do women feel so broken when it comes to sexual function? Because they think they're, they think they're supposed to have spontaneous desire, right? Going back to like the culture that we live in, think about our media, our movies, Hollywood, the music we listen to. Every single music song is spontaneous desire, right? Being thrown at us. And then we're like, I've been with this guy for like 10 years and I'm busy and I have a job and I'm raising some kids. I'm just not spontaneously desiring sex all the time. Like all of media is shoving in my face. We feel very, very broken about it. The data and the research says spontaneous desire is actually not the norm. The older you get, the more into a committed long-term relationship you are. Kind of that newness, that drug phase of, you know, spontaneous desire goes away for everybody universally after about six to 12 months. Nobody knows that, right? They just think they like fell out of love because they're not spontaneously desiring anymore. So responsive desire, which is, oh, I'm into this sexual activity because I'm into it now. I wasn't seeking it out, but now that I'm doing it, it's a good time, I have pleasure. That's responsive desire and is very, very common and normal for women. And yeah. men have responsive desire too, right? They're just stereotype, testosterone's more the stereotype for spontaneous desire, but men have responsive desire too, especially as they get older. Yeah, I remember in marriage counseling one time, uh, it was actually a friend that was getting married and he said his pastor told him that men are like microwaves. It's like an on off and women are like a crock pot. And sometimes it takes a little longer <laughs> to heat up the food. But I think that that is where, where there seems to be women perceive this as an imbalance. And I noticed that it tends to be women who are postpartum who have small children, who have careers and are suddenly comparing their, you know, spontaneous desire in their thirties and forties to what it was in their twenties. And they think that something they'll say, uh, Dr. Seaman, can you check my hormones? I think there's something wrong. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think our culture likes supplements. We like drugs. We like quick fixes for complex problems. And I think that's where the hormones come in is like, please let this be a quick fix for a complex problem. Right. And sometimes it is, sometimes the hormones are off and sometimes we can adjust it. And, I, and I'm not saying hormones aren't important. I think they play a role, 
But to be like, hormones can't make your relationship great, your stress is reduced, you're 80 things on your plate every day, right? And so it's really understanding sexuality and how you prioritize the importance of that in your life. I think so many women, again, on the quick fix thing, they just want me to give them spontaneous desire, right? Doctor, mm -hmm. fix my desire. It's or like, like a that pill that would make me want to have sex with my husband every single night. Right, right. And uh, that's what he wants. Yeah. And the other thing about it is where women have prioritized sex as, is it for them or is it something they're doing for somebody else? Is it something they're doing for their partner because they want to, right? If when sex becomes a chore, you do not desire it. So looking at your desire and being like, where have you put sex in your world? Is it for you or are you doing it for somebody else because somebody else wants it? And as soon as you start doing that, don't expect to have any spontaneous desire for it. Yeah. Is it true that the more women partic participate in sexual activity, though, that desire tends to increase? Yeah. So they're actually, um, Barry, Barry McCarthy wrote an awesome book I recommend to everybody called Reclaiming Desire. And in it, he says it's about at least every other week, like some baseline of sexuality. It's not like hunger, right? We think of hunger of like the less you've eaten, the more starving you get. That's not how sex works, right? The less sex you have, the more you're kind of like, man, whatever because we forget, and this is the dopamine reaction, right? Like we actually forget how great pleasurable things are. Like I forget how awesome that ice cream was that I ate last week was, right? We just, for, that's the way our bodies work. We forget good pleasure. And so we have great pleasure with sex. We forget about it, but the more we kind of keep it in our life and prioritize it, the easier it is, you're, it's a skill, the better skilled you are at it. So when you're in, so he kind of puts the baseline at like every other week. Now, mm -hmm. I'm always very careful with that because I think we very easily slide into like the shoulds of like, you should have sex this much. And another then thing on my list, like another thing on your like list, has, totally. Yeah. It's like eight fruits and vegetables, eight hours of sleep, you know, like 30 minutes of cardio and sex. And it's like, as soon as you put sex on a checklist, again, you lose your desire for it. But mm -hmm. I think there is something to like, if you want an active, healthy sex life in your relationship, you do have to prioritize it. It's not an accident. When we look at those people who are happily sexually satisfied, it's not an accident that they're that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always talk about sexual health as like one of the pillars of health, just like you should like figure out how to eat right and figure out how to move right. Sexual health is something that takes a concerted effort. I think too, working with female patients that I find that um, a lot of women don't understand in our central nervous system, you know, we have this kind of excitation and in inhibition that are constantly, and not just when it comes to sex, but just a lot of things, just our primal organism is constantly in a, trying to figure out how to make us survive as a species. And uh, I think in women, we start to see a little bit more of the inhibitory, like the brake pedals. And in men, it's more excitatory, more the gas pedal. There's certainly women and men that fall on both sides of that. But I tend to see in female patients that there's a lot more inhibition. And I think that's probably for a variety of reasons. So one, let's talk about anatomy, because I don't think a lot of women even understand their own anatomy. So as a urologist, can you talk about women's sexual parts and what, and what role they play in sexual function? Yeah, it's so important because again, it's, you know, on repeat, it's the you are not broken, right? Like so many women, they come in and they're like, well, you know, putting the penis in the vagina just doesn't do it for me. And after you, you know, become the expert and learn all this, you're like, it actually doesn't do it for 70% of women, right? 70% 70 of women do not have orgasm by putting a penis in their vagina. Penetrative the, intercourse. Yeah. Penetrative inter PIV is what we, because it's a mouthful to say it. But so the 30% that do probably have some clitoral stimulation going on. And they've actually done research on how close is your clitoris to your vagina. And, and like it, the people study this stuff, but you're not broken if putting in the penis in the vagina is not enough for you. You're also not broken if three minutes of sexual activity is not enough for you. What we're doing is we're comparing ourselves to a young male model, right? Which is very damaging because we're women, not men. And it's also damaging to the men because as the men age, they compare themselves to how they were when they were 18. They feel broken because their bodies change as well. Um, so clitoris is the organ of the anatomy organ that is basically the penis equivalent, except for the clitoris only has one job and its only job is pleasure. And then people will be like, but the penis is a pleasure. I'm like, penis has three jobs. It has to pee it has to get the semen out to fertilize the female and its pleasure. So it's got three jobs. The clitoris's only job is pleasure. 
It actually wraps underneath the labia, the external labia, and the labia minora is also intimately connected with the clitoris. So the clitoris is like a wishbone. We just don't get taught that. Mm -hmm. But that's why stimulating the entire vulva all the way around the vagina is pleasurable for women. And a lot of women need that to have an orgasm. Yeah, I think women think of it as just this little dot that's above the urethra, but it's actually quite large. It extends down the vulva, which is the labia, like Dr. Casper, Casperson was saying, and then a back. If you if you had a female pelvis that we could, just, I have a picture, but for the Apple podcasters and Spotify, they're, they're not going to see the, the picture, but it extends along the anterior vaginal wall too, which is why sometimes even with penetrative intercourse, women may experience more pleasure in different positions, depending on, you know, where the friction is being provided inside the vagina. And so it's actually quite large. And, um, and I don't think women understand this, which is why the labia, the menorah, the majora, all of that is still part of your, your sexual organs and, and provide sexual pleasure and arousal. Yep. And I think another thing that women don't get taught is how important it is for her arousal and blood flow to make sex and penetration comfortable. Cause mm -hmm. so many people have such a narrow view of what sex is. We call sex penis and vagina sex and they rush to penetration. Well, she doesn't have blood flow, which brings in kind of just this, it creates more like spongy and flexible and it's 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 expanded and dilated and it doesn't hurt as much to put something in your vagina when you are properly aroused and if we rush in to do that we have we have this epidemic of pain with sex right and i would say pain with sex is not normal see somebody who's an expert but one common reason is that women certainly aren't educated on what their body needs before they get to that part of sex mm -hmm. all all pleasurable touching is sex but we've narrowed it so narrow that when we have penis problems, erectile dysfunction, or vagina problems, whatever they might be, we feel completely broken because we've taken everything else off the table. We don't call it sex. Yeah. Yeah. As medical providers, we want to make sure if a patient's complaining to this, right, there's no infection. Um, lubrication will be different depending on if a woman's premenopausal, postmenopausal. And I want to talk about that before we end. Um, certainly different times of the month. Women are making more estrogen, more progesterone. The cervical mucus is thinner, tackier, those types of things. And then the, the vagina, right? We talked about this tissue, but there's more to the pelvic floor and the pelvic floor function. There's nerves and there's muscles and there's connective tissue. And another disorder I see amongst younger women, more than older women, is vaginismus, where we get this spasm in the pelvic floor or high tone pelvic floor, in which case pelvic physical therapy therapy can be so important for these women in regaining, you know, sexual activity, especially penetrative intercourse, or even the ability to use tampons and things like that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And whenever pain and people, you know, people will come to see me and they'll be like, I have two problems. I have pain with sex and low desire. And I say, no, no, no. You have one problem. You have pain with sex. You mm -hmm. will never desire something that's painful, right? right. So you got to fix the pain and make sex enjoyable and pleasurable and something to look forward to there. There comes the desire. It's almost like people are trying to fix for desire without paying attention to the quality of the sex. We just want quantity. The quality is what matters. That quality is then what drives your desire. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. So we've established normal anatomy. First of all, I encourage all, I have three daughters. I think that women should look at their own genitalia and see what it looks like and be able to touch your own genitalia and know what parts bring you pleasure, what feels good, what doesn't feel good, because I don't think if you can do that as an individual that you'll ever be able to communicate that, you know, with a partner. But remember too, that, and this comes with so much stigma. And I talk about it on my, you know, social media a lot, that self-touch masturbation is completely normal for both men and women. And um, it just really needs to be destigmatized because sexual health and orgasms, there's great data that orgasms <laughs> increase longevity. And sometimes people don't have a partner and we're not saying that you have to go find one just for that. Um, sexual health takes, takes many forms. Yes. Um, so, but one of the other things that I think um, is hurting women's sexual function is, I don't know how to say it's cultural, but social media in general, we know gives women poor body image. Like there are, this is like well studied, especially teenage girls, because you're seeing things that aren't always real, especially with Photoshop and filters and, and just women's bodies. I think the, the, the body self-confidence has become an issue. And there have been movements with normalizing, you know, every size and, and these types of things. But can you talk about what role that plays in sexual health for women? Because I think it is yeah. an issue. It is. It's absolutely an issue because what women are doing is now sex has, the other thing I think the visualness of the social media has done is sex is almost more of a performance 
than mm -hmm. a, a pleasure. And if it's a performance, there it's good and bad. You failed. You can fail right. at a performance. Win or loss. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So you get a lot of that. They think there's a lot more of that going on now because of social media, porn, the availability of vid video, visual, right? Am I, and am I matching up to what I think the expectation should be of this performance? And when you do that, when you think, what are my thighs doing? What are, what's he thinking? It's called spectatoring, right? So now you're kind of watching yourself have sex. Mm -hmm. There goes all of the things that are necessary for orgasm. You can't be doing that because it's distracting the brain, right? So you're actually kind of taking away your pleasure by being the spectator of like, am I good enough? Am I too jiggly? Am I, you know, all that stuff. And the other thing is, we, you know, the researchers on desire, they think that the closer a woman matches to the ideal of what our society says female sexuality is, the better her desire is. There's a lot of that of like, there are certain bodies or disabilities or ageism, all these things of these people that shouldn't be sexual, when in reality, we are all sexual. Se sexual is, is for everybody, but that's not what society tells us. So we're always kind of comparing, do we match up to who's allowed to be sexual? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think I've experienced that as a medical professional. I had another colleague, I did a post on sexual health. Another colleague was like, I think that was really inappropriate. And I'm thinking to myself, if I'm not supposed to talk about it, who's supposed to talk about this? Like, <laughs> yeah, the other, the other like experts, it's sex, like sex is like a low thing. Like it's the people, the, like, it's almost like the stigma of sex workers and strippers and like, no, like even very highly successful professional people have sex lives. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's everywhere and nobody wants to talk about it. And you think about like how our, how our doctors train of like eating right. Well, we don't teach that very much. Uh, exercising our body. We're not taught that. And then sexual health. We're not taught that, that like these very important things to the care of bodies and relationships. We're not really taught it. Yeah. So it's even more important. Um, I think that um, another thing is I always have to educate women that sexual health is not always penetrative intercourse because there you can have sexual encounters even with your partner 40, 50 years and not have intercourse and you can still get arousal, you can still have orgasms and you can still contribute to your sexual health and wellness. And that's something I think that just women don't understand either. They yeah. just like... I have, I don't, I don't know about you. I have so many women and it, I wouldn't even say it's an age. I was going to say it's kind of baby boomer age, but I, I can't break it down into age. All they want is to be able to put something in their vagina because that's what their partner wants. And I'm like, but what do you want? And mm -hmm. they have no idea what they want. Like, I don't think they've had their own, they're again, having sex for somebody else. And when you start doing it, doing it that way, you lose that desire. You lose that it's about you. You lose that really important part of intimacy with your partner because you're just doing it like it's a chore. And I'm like, is, is your only goal to put something in your vagina? And some people say, yes. And it's like, that's where we are. Or the other thing, again, talking about menopause, is I see lots of women, they stopped having sex 10 years ago, right? So it's like, my goal is to move that needle to be like, you don't have to stop having sex just because of menopause. It's actually mm -hmm. a myth. Like there are many, many, many happy, they'd say their sexual peak, 50s, 60s, 70s, for multiple reasons, right? Why do you I'm think not, that is? Why do you think that is? I'm not going to get pregnant, right? That takes a huge stress off of it. I'm more comfortable with myself now than I ever have been. I'm more comfortable with my partner than I ever have been. Kind of this liberation of like, screw what society thinks about this. This is about me. And there, it's almost like this, this homecoming into their own sexuality. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, let's talk about menopause because we brought it up. Um, common complaint. Women come in. I'm having, I'm having pain with intercourse. Literal words that I've heard patients say, it feels like sandpaper. It feels like a gravel pit. Um, I could probably make an entire page of things that women have said. What's happening? Uh What's happening? So, so menopause by definition is no, and you're better than me because you've got more training in this, but the definition of menopause, because a lot of people don't even know what menopause means, right? They just think of a 70 year old woman. So <clears throat> menopause means no periods after 12 months, average age 51, 52 in America. And it, no periods kind of naturally, not because you had your uterus removed or you have an IUD. Right. Um, so what's happening is your estrogen becomes low enough that you're not producing eggs and having periods, but your estrogen becomes low enough 
that's actually affecting other parts of your body. A big area that gets affected is the pelvis and they call it now genital urinary syndrome of menopause. It's a mouthful, but it includes that dry vagina, painful vulva, painful intercourse, urinary urgency, frequency, more UTIs, burning with urination, all of that is menopause. And I'll tell women, I'm like, did anybody ever tell you that this is very, very common after menopause? And they're like, no, people just think menopause is hot flashes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so easily treated. Um, but I think that a lot of women just get scared away from the fact that one of the best treatments for it is vaginal estrogen therapy, which is hormone therapy. And it comes with this like huge stigma. Women think there's all these risks associated and vaginal estrogen, estrogen therapy is different than systemic. And we're going to talk about it at the end of the episode, because I pulled an article that, um, I do something at the end of every episode called the semen analysis. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But I'm just telling you, if there's any menopausal woman right now that is like, oh my gosh, that's me. It's dry. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. Talk to your provider. There are lots of options, even for patients with a history of breast cancer. There are options for vaginal hormone therapy, lubricants, moisturizers. Um, like Dr. Casper said, if it hurts, you don't have low desire. You'll never, you'll never want to do it. And I always tell patients, trust me, if men's penises turn to sandpaper uh, when they went through andropause, which for people listening, they go through a very similar transition where their testosterone starts going down. Trust me, there would be some magical cream they would slather all over yeah. <laughs> their penis and nobody would blink. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, women are so afraid to bring it up. I have a friend who is a urologist. She's in this, like her whole platform is vaginal estrogen. Um, her name is Dr. Rachel Rubin. She's amazing. And she says, if men's testicles fell off at age 50, there would be a national vaccine. Yeah. Right. It's and so here, here we are. And, you know, the other thing about menopause, you know, in society is like, we should, we should all over women in menopause. You should do this. You should do that. You shouldn't take anything because it's natural. And it's like, we are so busy telling women what to do and not listening to the fact that they're actually suffering and their relationships are suffering. And here they think they should be natural. And I'm like, well, poor eyesight's natural. And we don't tell people not to wear glasses. Like there's tons of stuff that's natural and we treat it, right? If you have a painful vagina and you're getting infections and it hurts to pee, yes, it's natural, but we can treat it just like dry eyes are natural, but we can treat it. So I like to bring awareness of like, stop shooting all over these women and telling them that what they should and shouldn't do unless you've actually lived, lived a day in their shoes. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a second. The, um, the equity between men's health and women's health when it comes to sexual and reproductive health, because you're a urologist. So you see more men, you yeah. said you have a female predominated practice, but, um, there's very limited options when it comes to quote unquote, hypoactive sexual desire disorder for women. Can you talk about what those options are? If they're even worthwhile, worthwhile for women to pursue? Yeah. So the good news is we, the medical community and the pharmacologists have taken an interest, right? They're like, maybe this isn't all. So sexuality is biopsychosocial. There's a biology component. That's our body. That's where the hormones fit in. That's where these medications fit in. Psycho is what you think about sex. Is sex something that you have do for you? You know, kind of like your, your attitude towards sex. And then social is like, what's society telling you about sex, right? Are they saying it's okay for you to have sex? So we exist in this biopsychosocial world. The meds that have come out are to try to improve that bio part. So filbanserin is Addy, the brand name in the generic, and then bremelanotide is- PC-141, it's a peptide. Yeah, it's Vilesi. So one's an injectable, one's an everyday oral pill. Um, the good news is it works in some people. The bad news is we don't know who those people are gonna be and it doesn't work for the rest of them. So mm -hmm. for some people, it really is, hey, my brain just needs a little more dopamine, kind of like an antidepressant, right? Like some people just need a little bit more serotonin to help their depression. But so most antidepressants like hurt people's sexual desire. Yes. And the reason why is antidepressants, the most common are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they, they work by making more serotonin in our brain. Serotonin is like happy satisfied. I'm not seeking out anything. It's like the opposite of what sex is, right? Where sex is more like drug dopamine. I want to go get it. I want to seek it out. So you have more serotonin, you actually have less sex drive. So that's a trade-off. Um, but so the I meds- what, Flobanserin though, in the clinical trials, they deemed it to be clinically effective because these women had one additional sexual encounter per month. Yeah. And- I don't 
I, and I tell women this, I'm like, listen, I don't know if you want to try it, if we can get it covered, cool, let's try it. But I mean, I don't know if women would say that that is what they would right. And the other thing clinically effective but. about it is like they had to measure something, right? And it's a lot more objective to measure sexual events than like your satisfaction about the events. And so it's for low sexual desire, but they measured number of sexual events, which is not even desiring sex, right? So you're right. like, well, did they even study what they were trying to get this drug approved for? Um, and that's where the critics will be like, yeah, it's just one more time a month. The proponents will be like, yeah, but if that's sex she wanted and that's sex she enjoyed, isn't it worth it? Right. 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 So it's, again, it's very, very nuanced, but I, I, my joke is I'll never give a woman drugs on the first date. Meaning like, if you come to me for low desire, you've got to read the books, ideally talk to a sex therapist, figure out that play, sex is for you. Kind of like all that stuff. That's so important. Know what your clitoris needs. All, and oh, okay, okay. Now let's try meds. Cause it's again, just like hormones, like it's not going to change your relationship. It's not going to change the fact that you're stressed and you don't prioritize your own self-care and sexuality. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderfully complex, which is what's so great about it, but you can't fix this stuff in a 15 minute doctor visit one time. Yeah. And it does come with a quote unquote black box warning for you can ask us to drink while you take it because it can cause hypotension. So of course everything comes with a double-edged sword. Um, okay. So let's talk about the injectable one. Yep. Clinically so effective. Yes, better than placebo. And remember, placebo placebos in sex med trials are like amazingly powerful. For example, in Viagra. Placebos in general. <laughs> yeah, in general, placebos work really great. But for sex, they work really great. Again, because the biggest sex organ is the brain, right? Mm -hmm. So men men who were given a sugar pill in the Viagra studies had an erection 40% of the this time. This is going to make your penis hard. This is going to make <laughs> your penis right hard. right it is. <laughs> so it does, right? And for women's studies, the placebo effect's even higher, right? So 50%, 60%. So it was better than placebo, which is already really high in number of satisfying sexual events. Um, basically what it does is it makes your brain kind of boop, focus on the now and be like, oh yeah, okay, sex, this, this is good. Because what our brains do is stereotypically, again, a, a busy female brain, it's thinking about the future, it's thinking about the past, it's thinking about the kids, it's, is everything okay? That's mm -hmm. not where desire for sex lives. Desire for sex lives like I'm in my body, I'm safe, I'm calm. This is all I'm gonna do right now. One of the chapters in my book is you can't frontal lobe this shit of like, you can't like think yourself into an orgasm. You literally have to like quiet the mind. Yeah. And like not be thinking about tomorrow. If you're having sex and you're thinking about tomorrow, having an orgasm is gonna be very, very challenging. Right, totally, totally. Okay, and the other thing about that is it's injectable. So to tell a woman, you're just going to stab this in your leg 30 minutes before you want to have sex. <laughs> and then yeah. it comes with, it comes with a high nausea rate. So that's, you know, yeah, like a pretty high nausea rate. Thing. Some Those people will something. be like, just give them anti-nausea meds to take with it. Right. My, <laughs> my, my big joke. So I've tried it because I'm a scientist. Right. So I'm like, Dunk, give myself an inch. It's, it's like a diabetes needle. It's very small. It actually doesn't hurt that much. I've tried it. And, uh, couple of little, I don't know, like 20 minutes afterwards, I had this horrible cough, just like mm -hmm. hacking, hacking cough, which is not sexy at all. And there's no desire when you have a horrible cough. And so like any good scientist, I'm going to repeat the study, right? Yeah. So a couple of weeks go by, I try it again, dunk, start coughing horribly again. And I'm like, I have the side effect of cough with this med. This would never work for me. It turns out cough is 3% side effects of the med, but like, you're not going to have sex if you're hacking away. Yeah. Then, the cough, then the cough goes away. But so that was my one little like, I'm going to try this thing, see if it's amazing. And for me, it was not. Um, but again, if you don't teach a woman that spontaneous desire is like a Hollywood myth and like for 18 year olds who are hot to trot with nothing else on their schedule, and then you just give her an injection, maybe she just is, you know, a number one and number two, maybe she wasn't having good sex to begin with. And you're mm -hmm. never going to desire something you're not having. It's not good to begin with. Number two, maybe she loves being sexual and it's a wonderful thing when she does it. She's just so busy and here she is beating herself up because she's not desiring it, but she has a great time at the party. It's like, if you have a great time at the party, nothing's broken. Mm -hmm. Just prioritize the party and be like, hey, I want to commit to going to the party once a week with you or whatever it might be. Yeah. Okay. So Viagra for men can't get an erection, erectile dysfunction, huge problem for men, multifactorial for sure. Women, obviously, there's something visual, right? You're not with a partner and they're like, oh, these 
parts aren't working, but I hear about women faking orgasms all the time in my clinic. And I've had a handful of women who swear that they've never had an orgasm in their life. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Um, we, the scientists think most women are capable of achieving orgasm. They just haven't figured it out yet, or they're buying into society's load of crap that women are bad if they're sexual, right? So biopsychosocial, we don't actually think it's bio. That's a biologic problem. We think it's a psycho, psycho meaning, is it okay? If the anatomy that? looks normal, if and they the say they can normal. get pleasure with touching themselves, but they say they've never been able to achieve an orgasm. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's super interesting about orgasm is how do you know somebody's having an orgasm, right? People will describe it. There are certain words people use, but they put women in MRI machines who said they were having orgasms. And they're like, well, if we define it by pelvic floor contractions at a rate of 0.8, you know, contractions per second, which is like the definition of orgasm, they weren't having an orgasm, right? So even when people say I'm having an orgasm and the researchers are like, I'm looking at, I'm like studying your muscle contractions and they're not, and they're like, oh no, that was an orgasm, mm -hmm. right? So the other thing is like, if you're having great pleasure, maybe you are, maybe you're not, you know, do we ever teach women what an orgasm is? No, we don't. We just, we just let them figure it out on their own. Right. And I think some other people, again, it's that, that watcher, right. If you're like, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. This is if you're kind of like watching yourself, try to have an orgasm that really dampens it down because the frontal lobe suppresses the, the part of the brain that where orgasm comes from. Right. Right. So that was and, a lot of different answers to like, she's not broken. She might just need a sex therapist is awesome. A really a high quality sex store can be awesome. And then a lot of just like what they call bibliotherapy is like reading about women's pleasure, getting into some of these books, making sure sex is for you and that it's allowed, you're allowing it, all those things. And the fake orgasm is interesting because so many women do it to please their partner or because they want bad sex to end. But what you're doing is you're reinforcing the bad sex because he thinks that's when the orgasm happens, right? So both people are responsible for the bad orgasm. It's not just his fault. And the other thing about that is like, they don't even have our anatomy. We, ha we literally have to teach them how our bodies work because they can't practice. Yeah, I remember in medical school, uh, I won't name names, but a colleague of mine, we were doing cadaver dissections and he had gotten through his undergraduate, which we do cadaver dissections in undergraduate anatomy. So I'm still confused how this person graduated, but they were still convinced that babies and urine came out of the same hole in women. So for women that don't understand your, your anatomy, uh, your vagina and your urethra are completely separate orifices. <laughs> Yep. Um, and the clitoris is just, just above that. And so explore your own anatomy and also understand that just like hair color, just like the structure of my face, everything about all of us is unique. Like vulvas all look different. I, oh my gosh, because Thanksgiving was just recently, everybody will laugh about this. I cannot remember the Instagram <laughs> profile. There is a woman out there. Um, we'll have to have her on a podcast. But she makes pies and the, the top of the pie is vulvas. Maybe you saw this too. But if she just wants to normalize like women's anatomy and the top of all of her pies are different shapes of vulvas. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I, that's really important. Again, going back to like social media and how it's affecting what we think about our body image is the rate of women getting vulvoplasties, labiaplasties, because they deem themselves as somehow abnormal is because we have this very curated, polished, airbrushed, surgically enhanced view of what female anatomy looks like. It's all vulvas are normal unless they're causing you pain. Um, the inner labia or lips can protrude. That's totally normal, especially in thinner women, totally normal. So just normalizing vulvar anatomy is like, they're like fingerprints. Everybody's different. And it doesn't mean that you're broken or need to have surgery. Yeah. Um, that is something that young women especially need to understand. Um, I have performed a handful of labiaplasties in my entire life. And it was literally because of pain from obstetrical injuries or um, women literally were having difficulty with, um, sexual function or exercise or something due to like hypertrophy on one side. But from a cosmetic standpoint, you have to be so cautious because 
like we talked about earlier, the vulva, the labia, the menorah, they, they extend into the clitoral hood, they connect to the clitoris. And so you could have, if nobody has counseled you, you could have a change in sexual arousal and function um, with scarring, pain with intercourse, if nobody's adequately counseled you. So you have to be really careful about cosmetic surgery of the vulva. Yes, this is a good public service announcement. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. The very the few surgeries I do are because they're catching. So they're either mm -hmm. catching on a bike or they're getting pulled into the vagina with sexual activity, yeah. causing pain and discomfort. So very specific indications for legitimate surgery, um, but they're not without side effects and and yeah. healing complications. Like it's surgery. Yeah. Um, let's talk about testosterone therapy. What it, does, does that help women have more orgasms, better sex, more desire? Yeah. I, the caveat again is biopsychosocial, right? It doesn't fix all the important things we think about sex and the, se the quality of the sex we're having, but testosterone is the hormone. If we were to pick a hormone that says, Hey, this is the hormone that kind of makes us seek out sex. Testosterone is it. Estrogen tends to be more, I'm interested in receiving right? Mm -hmm. Where, especially if you look at rap models and stuff like that. But so what they have approved and multiple societies have all published this paper is post-menopause testosterone supplementation for women with low desire. They haven't given us any other indication to give testosterone to these women, even though everybody's testosterone does go down after menopause. But one indication that you can get it for is low desire. Doesn't work in everybody, but some women just they're like, yes, I feel more like myself. I feel more like how I always have been. My sex life is back. So you're going to get a lot of rewarding statements when it works for a woman. And again, we're not trying to give her a quote unquote male level testosterone. We're just trying to give her the testosterone she always had before menopause and her hormones went down. So yeah. we're just trying to give her female testosterone levels. And that's another myth, right? When we label testosterone as a male hormone, We've erased its importance in 50% of the population. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and men have estrogen too. <laughs> and men have estrogen too, right? So we've deemed it not important for women when we've labeled it the male hormone. Yeah. What about some of the other topical agents? Um, I've seen compounded versions of like Vi Viagra creams, arginine, all sorts of different concoctions that women will come and ask me for. Yeah. So it works more for blood flow, right? So arousal, just like blood flow, you know, the obvious thing is an erection in a penis, but women have that blood flow, that arousal, which is not only pleasurable, but again, helps protect the structures from trauma and penetrative sex. So blood flow can be affected just like erections can. So smoking, heart disease, you know, small vessel disease. Um, but Viagra works by increasing blood flow. Right. That's why when we gave Viagra pills to women, it didn't increase their desire because the drug doesn't increase desire. It's just mm -hmm. when a man has an erection, he desires sex, but we can't give it to women and just expect desire. But topically as a cream, they're actually researching it right now as a topical cream to help with women who say, I just don't get as aroused as I used to. Right. Mm -hmm. Different than desire. We got to break all those little pieces down. But yeah, I, I want to do it. It's not happening. Yeah, it's just not happening. It doesn't feel like it used to, or, you know, it feels different. And so then there's a role for either topical sildenafil, which is currently compounded. It's not sildenafil's Viagra. It's not a prescription. Or you can do topical testosterone to the clitoris, to the vulva. Um, topical estrogen, again, helps bring in that collagen, bring in that blood flow. So there's a couple of different, different options. As far as like the herbal stuff, there isn't great studies screaming that any herb or, you know, yeah. compound is, is like the magic bullet for it. But again, L-arginine, I think again, is a blood flow. Yeah, I agree. How about uh, some of the technologies like high intensity magnet sound waves, once again, increasing nerve and blood flow, but have you yeah. ever seen those to be clinically effective for women with arousal disorders? I haven't. I, again, laser lasers more um, brings in collagen and blood flow, which I think helps tissue, which helps decrease the trauma to tight tissue, mm -hmm. helps make penetrative sex more comfortable. I think there's a role for laser therapy. But as far as arousal, I stay very far away from the O-shot, which is platelet plasma injections to the clitoris. Um, there's really not a lot of data. Same goes for the men, right? The, the men with the um, sound waves on the penis, the national guidelines say it should only be done in clinical trials at this time. We just don't know who the right people are yet. Yeah. And again, I think there's so much education that's lacking. I hate to be like, you know what you're missing? You're missing platelets in your clitoris. Like, no, they're usually missing anatomy and understanding and how to communicate and how to prioritize. Like they're missing all of that education. I don't just think putting something on the clitoris is going to solve all the problems, but it yeah. can for some people. We just don't, haven't done enough research yet. 
Totally. And sometimes it's trial and error. I'm like, well, if I don't think there's a lot of harm involved and a woman wants to try something great and if it's placebo effect and she's having, you know, more positive sexual encounters alone or with her partner or whatever it is. So those are all things that we have to weigh. Okay. So I want to go back to this idea of management of menopausal symptoms again, to just highlight this, because it's something I see so much. Um, so I pulled this study, there was like a plethora of studies I could have pulled, but I pulled this one because it was uh, super recent. It was titled genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Like Dr. Casperson said, a huge mouthful, but this was just an overview of all the pathophysiology and the etiology and the valuation. And it really just talks about how there are sex, sexual implications for more than 50% of postmenopausal women, um, that it's a sensitive issue. Like I highlighted earlier, bring it up with your doctors. There's tons of options, including estrogen therapy. Um, oxytocin is another one that sometimes is used. DHEAs, um, like we talked about laser therapies, all of these things. And it's super safe and super effective. I pulled the ACOG practice bulletin. So Dr. Casperson is a urologist. I'm a gynecologist, but there's a lot of overlap. There's even this profession called urogynecology that kind of does both. Um, but we all treat women with these symptoms. And for management of, of this uh, vaginitis that happens in pregnancy, topical estrogen therapy is really the mainline treatment, even, even for patients with breast cancer, it's very effective at low doses. We don't really see systemic doses, maybe in some studies, some intermittent elevations in systemic levels, but um, it's super effective and there's tons of ways to give it. There's like vaginal rings, there's creams, there's gels, there's capsules, there's suppositories. So it's really just patient preference on, on how you want to dose it, but it's, it's so effective. And so if you're suffering um, from vaginal dryness and menopause or pain with intercourse after menopause, that is not normal. So call your doctor. Um, okay. So Dr. Casperson, give people some advice. This woman in wherever in the world is listening right now. And she's like, I totally have low sexual desire. Give her some advice and then tell people where they can find you, how they can work with you and talk to us about your podcast and your book too. Awesome. So the first thing I tell her is she's not broken. It's not a personality flaw. It's just where she is in life, right? And good for her for, for thinking, hey, maybe there's something I can do about this because I think a lot of people just live in shame about it. The first thing I want people to think about is the quality of the sex that they're having. Is it good quality sex? Is it is it for both partners or is it happening just for one person? The quality of the sex really matters as far as that desire. And again, Barry McCarthy in his book, Reclaiming Desire will say, that has to be good. That's what we should work on. The desire itself will rise up then. Again, number two, spontaneous desire, that really high testosterone, 18 year old male Hollywood view that everybody's given isn't realistic for most people. And that should not be the goal for most people. Understanding what they call that limerence phase, that six to 12 months at the beginning of a relationship is actually like being on a drug. It goes away for everybody. You get into this more committed long-term relationship where sexual health is so important that when it's there, they say it adds about 15 to 20% to the quality of re your relationship. But when it's not there, it can be devastating for the relationship. You have to prioritize it though. It doesn't happen accidentally. Um, so that's what I'm all about is just educating women and then saying, hey, maybe if you're 56 and you're noticing this, let's help you talk to your doctor about what kind of vaginal estrogen is right for you if nothing else is working. So my podcast is called You Are Not Broken. I've decided to write a book, which is going to come out next year. It's called You Are Not Broken. Stop shooting all over your sex life. So I, I love it. it. I love it. I can't wait. So that, you think that'll come out next year? Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing, the last thing I just want to end with is, um, sexual encounters are always in context. And I always tell women, you know, if the, if the kitchen sink is full and your kids are, I I'll just, I'm, I'm very open and honest. So I will just share with the world a little bit about my own sex life. My husband and I are trying to have an intimate moment the other day. And literally we can hear all three of our children. Like, it's like, they're having like a WWE match. And both of us finally were like, can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it is hard sometimes as a mom, I've got three young kids. So I just want anybody out there listening. That's because I find it's, it's people like me that I see in my clinic right across, you know, the table for me. Um, there is nothing wrong with you. You're not broken, but sometimes you need a date night or you need a vacation or you, you need somewhere to go because sex is all in context. Some people 
fantasize about having sex in an open parking lot. And for some people that would be a huge inhibition and they wouldn't even be able to enjoy it. So just remember that figure out where your excitatory pedals are and figure out where your inhibitory brakes are. That's the one thing I found success with personally um, after being a mom and having children is I know the things that will completely shut me down. And my partner has started to figure out those things too. Like one time I came home and he had completely, he, he knows I hate laundry. He folded my entire, all my laundry, he put away all my laundry. And I was like, all right, I know. shut the door. I <laughs> my, my husband's figured out that once when I come back from doing like a yoga session, like he's, he's, I didn't even figure it out. He, he's like, Hey, you wanna? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, huh, that's always a good opportunity. Like, cause I'm, parasympathetic nervous system, right? Yeah. The, cortis the cortisol's gone. And I think, you know, to wrap up is we live in cortisol. Go, 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 go. Plan, 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 plan. That's not where good sex happens. And mm -hmm. like, like you said, figuring out what we need, the context that we need to drop into that parasympathetic, accepting, relaxed, pleasure, nervous system to actually yeah. enjoy sex because you can't yeah. cortisol your way to a great orgasm. And it's not all about sex, you know, give each other a massage, have a meaningful conversation. Most people these days don't even understand how to communicate. Like just literally having another human listen to you sometimes is, is amazing. So totally, totally. for it. good, for good relationship tips, uh, the Gottman Institute is awesome. They have great social media. Just start, start working on your relationship in general. And the, the, the experts say work on the relationship in general and the sex at the same time, because that's better than like one or the other. Amazing. Amazing. All right, you guys. Well, I hope you got lots of amazing knowledge. Go find Dr. Casperson on social media, check out her podcast, check out her new book coming out next year. She's a wealth of knowledge and I appreciate you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody have a good night.